Shielding and the Effective Nuclear Charge. All right, so now we're going to start talking about why periodic trends are observed, okay? So it's not enough to just talk about periodic trends, which we'll do after talking about the effect of nuclear charge, but why they're observed. And basically, chemical reactivity is mainly determined by valence electrons. And the big question is why? And it has to do with a concept called shielding or also called screening. And basically, shielding is the presence of core electrons, so electrons that are between a valence electron and the nucleus, they reduce the attraction that those valence electrons feel for the nucleus. So for instance, you know, if you have an electron out in the n equals 3, so 3s subshell, for sodium, that electron feels much less nuclear charge than an inner electron, something in n equals 2 or n equals 1. So outer electrons feel a lot less positive charge from the nucleus. And so basically, we think of that reduced nuclear charge as the effective nuclear charge. So the amount of nuclear charge that is actually felt versus what it would be if all of the nuclear charge would, was felt, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. So remember, protons are positively charged, and electrons are negatively charged, and electrons are attracted to the protons in the nucleus. There's an attraction there. And when you have core electrons in the way of an outer electron, it reduces that amount of positive charge that the electron can feel. And so we call that the effective nuclear charge. And the effective nuclear charge is always less than Z for a given element. And it's because of those core electrons. They're in the way. All right, so how does this work? And I think we need a few pictures to start thinking about this. Now, just to remind you, before I give you the simplified version of an atom. Just to remind you the real structure of an atom, we have an electron cloud around the nucleus and it's 99% over 99% empty space, okay? And remember that electrons are wave functions that we call orbitals, but they do not go around in orbits like I'm going to show next, okay? So just keep that in mind, but what I'm going to show next is a useful mental model to start thinking about the effective nuclear charge. Okay, so let's look at hydrogen first. So this is really, really super simple, okay? And what we have here is one proton in the nucleus, okay? And we have an electron, okay? And, and in the ground state, that electron would be in the 1s, all right? And there are no other electrons between it. So here's the electron and there's the proton, nothing's in the way, so that electron is feeling the full nuclear charge from the nucleus, okay? So in this case, the atomic number, Z, so the one proton is equal to Z effective. Now, things get more complicated when you add another electron. So let's go to helium. Now, helium has two protons, okay? And it also has two electrons, and in the ground state, they're going to be in the 1s orbital, okay? Now, each of these two guys is the same average distance away from the nucleus. So now remember, they're not exactly this distance from the nucleus. It's an average, so they might be out here or over here, but overall, it, they average out to this distance from the nucleus, all right? And... But they also don't have to move together, so basically sometimes they're going to get in each other's way, all right? And that is shielding. So they get in each other's way and they shield the nuclear charge. All right, so again, so, you know, like I say, this guy might spend a little teeny bit of time here, this guy here, you know, so again, I'm still not speaking in quantum mechanical language, but trying to give you a picture of what's going on, and basically, sometimes this electron's going to be in front of this electron, and vice versa, okay? And so they cancel out some of the nuclear charge felt by the other electron. 
All right, so now let's go to lithium, okay? And this is where things begin to get even more interesting. So now, when we add that third electron, look where we have to add it. So if we were to write the electron configuration for the ground state, it's going to be in the 2s, right? And lithium has three protons. Now, this average distance is farther away than the 1s, okay? So these guys are almost always going to be in front of this guy, all right? And since they're almost always in front of him, they essentially shield two units of nuclear charge from this electron, okay? Now, it isn't quite that perfect, but it's, it's close, and we're going to use it as an approximation. So now these are core electrons, and they're in the way of this valence electron, okay? And they're screening positive nuclear charge, and they're actually screening one unit of nuclear charge each, each of those core electrons. Okay, so again, so now this guy's way out here, okay? These guys on average are much closer to the nucleus. We have three protons, two units of nuclear charge are canceled out by these inner core electrons, and so this electron way out here, he basically only feels plus one nuclear charge from that nucleus. And so we would say that that is the effective nuclear charge, is plus one. All right, so what we're going to do here to start understanding the effective nuclear charge is talk about some simplified Slater's rules, okay? Now, I've simplified these way down, but they're useful to get a picture of what's going on with the effective nuclear charge as we go across the periodic table, okay? So we're going to go across a period, and we're going to talk about what happens to the effective nuclear charge. And so a super rough calculation has Z effective being equal to the number of protons, so that's Z, the atomic number, minus the screening from the core electrons, minus the screening from the valence electrons. Okay, so remember valence electrons are the ones that are only in the way part of the time because they're in the same, they're the same average distance from the nucleus. The core electrons are almost always in front of the valence electrons. All right, and so each core electron, using our simplified Slater's rules, each core electron is going to cancel out one unit of nuclear charge. So we're just going to say if it's a core electron, it's going to cancel out a whole unit of nuclear charge. The valence electron situation is a little bit more complicated, and so you count up your number of valence electrons and subtract one because you have to watch one, or you have to have one electron that is feeling that effective nuclear charge, and then we're going to multiply that by 0.35. So basically, each valence electron cancels out only about a third of a unit of nuclear charge each, okay? So let's see how this works. All right, so, and I, I've actually already said this. So we're going to subtract off one valence electron for calculating the screening from valence electrons. And that's because we have to have one to watch. So we're going to watch one and see how it feels, the effective nuclear charge. And then all the other guys are going to be there to screen that one guy that we're watching. Okay, so for instance, if there are five valence electrons, then we would count up four of them and multiply it by 0.35. Okay, and same if there are eight total, then we would only count up seven of them. Okay, so now let's start looking at the effective nuclear charge using our simplified Slater's rules. Okay, so let's look at lithium first. So remember, lithium has three protons. Okay, it has a total of three electrons, two of which are in the 1s, that's 1s2, and those are core electrons, and then here's our valence electron, the guy that we're watching, okay, and he's in the 2s, okay, so his electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s1, all right? Now, if we want to calculate the effective nuclear charge, we realize that lithium has two core electrons, okay, and one valence electron, so we're going to take Z, which is 3, minus the screening from the two core electrons, and remember they each screen out one whole unit of positive charge, so minus 2, and then there are no other valence electrons, so that's going to be 0, 
to get plus 1 for our effective nuclear charge. Okay, now what happens when we go to beryllium? So we're just going to go one more, all right? One, the next neighboring element, okay? So now we have atomic number of four, so we have four protons, and of course we have four electrons for the neutral atom, and two of them are going to be in the 1s, okay? So that's 1s2, and then the other two are going to be in the 2s, so that'd be 2s2, all right? So remember, on average, these two guys are farther away from the nucleus than this one, all right? So these guys are almost always in front of these two guys, and these two guys can get in each other's way, but only part of the time. So they only screen part of the nuclear charge, all right? So if we want to calculate the effective nuclear charge using our, our simplified Slater's rules for beryllium, what we're going to do, we're going to take Z, so there's our four units of nuclear charge, Two full units are screened by these core electrons, okay? And then we only have one other valence electron besides the one we're watching, so we're going to subtract off 0.35, all right? And that's going to give us 1.65, so that is higher than lithium's effective nuclear charge, all right? Now, what about nitrogen? So let's move on across the periodic table. So we, now we have seven protons. And we have seven electrons, of course, all right? Two of them are in the 1s, all right? And the other five are valence electrons. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. And those are in the 2s and 2p, so 2s2 and 2p3, all right? So now we're going to take z, so seven. Two units are completely screened by these inner core electrons, okay? And then we're going to watch one electron, count the other four, and multiply it by 0.35, and we're going to end up with 3.6, okay? And so basically, the effective nuclear charge for nitrogen went up again. So now let's look at neon, all right? So now things are getting interesting. All right, neon has 10 protons, okay, atomic number is 10, all right. It also has 10 electrons, two are still in the 1s, okay. And then neon has eight valence electrons, it's a noble gas, so it has a noble gas configuration, okay. And we're going to watch one of these electrons, and then now there are seven valence electrons that can get in each other's way and screen nuclear charge from each other, all right? So calculating the effective nuclear charge with our simplified Slater's rules, we're going to take Z is equal to 10, okay? So there's our 10 units of positive charge. Two of them are going to be screened by these 1s electrons, these core electrons. And then we have seven valence electrons times 0.35 each, okay? They're going to screen a little over a third of a unit of positive charge each, and we're going to end up with a, an effective nuclear charge of 5.55. So that is significantly higher than nitrogen, which was higher than beryllium, which was higher than lithium. So we can see that as we go across the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge increases across a period. Now, what happens when we start over and we go to sodium. Okay, so our valence electron for sodium is now in the 3s, okay? So we have 11 protons, we also have 11 electrons, and we filled the 1s, and we filled the 2s and the 2p, okay? And then look where our guy is now. Our valence electron is way out here, all right? And so the 2s and the 2p became core electrons, all right? So 1s already was core electrons from neon's perspective. For neon, the valence electrons were the 2s and 2p, okay? But now that we're looking at sodium, his valence electron is way in the 3s, okay? Way out there. So now... Sodium has 10 core electrons, okay? These guys are all core electrons, and they cancel out one unit of nuclear charge each, all right? So here's Z, 11. I'm going to subtract off 10 
core electrons, all right? So this group became core electrons. And we don't have any other valence electrons to look at, so at 0 times 0 0.35, and we're going to get plus 1 for the effective nuclear charge, okay? So we're kind of right back where we started. And like I say, we're using simplified Slater's rule, so it doesn't come out exactly like that. But the trend is present, and we can demonstrate it using these ideas. So basically, if we were to march across the thir third period and do the same thing, we would see that the effective nuclear charge increases across a period. And so that is our trend. Now, our other periodic trends, or our periodic trends, come out of this effective nuclear charge increasing across a period. Okay? Now, the other factor in periodic trends is the principal quantum number. Okay? So remember, the shell, or the principal shell, determines the size of the orbital. Okay? The principal quantum number n gives us the size of the orbital. So the larger the orbital, the farther away, on average, the electron is from the nucleus. And if it's farther away, if we looked at the Coulombic potential, if it's farther away, then less, there's less attraction. And so less positive charge is felt by that electron just due to distance. Okay? So this is the other factor in periodic trends. All right? And of course, as we go down a column, n increases. And so the size of our orbitals increases as we go down a column. Electrons are farther and farther away on average and so they feel less nuclear attraction. Okay? So you put those two things together and you get your periodic trends arising from that. And the effective nuclear charge dominates across a period and the principal quantum number n dominates down a column. And together, the effective nuclear charge and the principal quantum number give rise to our periodic trends.